Yes, thank you for the invitation and yeah, it's nice to be here again. Maybe a few wo words about me. So I'm in the Scala world since quite some time. So it goes in the direction of 10 years, but not, not yet. So um, I worked on Spray before and on Akai HTTP. Mm. Um, so I did this mostly as a freelancer while working on my projects, on other projects. When Spray was successful, um, we, we started actually doing consulting with the topic of Spray, helping people using Spray. Um, so and in my last project, I actually worked with Inoyo, so it's another reason it's nice to be here again, because I worked here in this building for some, some months. So and now, since September, I'm actually in the Akka team again, working on Akka HTTP, but also on all other projects of, um, in the, in the Akka, under the Akka umbrella. Um, so I'm now working for Lightband, and so here I am. So maybe before we start, um, who, who's using Akka right now? So about the half, okay. Um, and who has used Spray before? Okay, two, yeah, that's, that's fine. And so Akka HTTP, already moved to Akka HTTP? Yay, Matthias. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, yeah, because I thought about um, effective HTTP, should this be a beginner talk or more an advanced talk? So, um, so I tried to put beginner things into it and then go on, go on, make, make it harder in the end. So depending on how much you have used it, it may be, may be boring in the beginning, but Hopefully, you, you, if you are a beginner, you will still understand something in the end. So, <laughs> Okay, so let's start with Akka. Akka, this is just something which I just copied from the Akka webpage. So it says, Akka is a toolkit and runtime for building highly concurrent, distributed, and resilient message-driven applications on the JVM. So this is a very, very general statement. And um, so... I will go into it, which kind of modules it's actually, what is everything in the toolkit. So um, if we look at it, what is really a toolkit? A toolkit means um, there are several things in there. So when people discover a new library, often they, they just see a box and in there is just a hammer and they just see this one thing and try to use it for everything. But this, this is not how, how Akka is so thought to be used. So instead, it's a, it's a toolkit used for certain kinds of applications. And depending on what you want to do, you choose the right parts, the right components, and use them together in your application. So basically, that's what I said <laughs> just there. And um, so you, you have much freedom. So it's sometimes not easy to find out what, what you want to use. So. This is a bit of the guiding line through the talk. So the same with Akka HTTP. It has various la layers of APIs which are actually used inside of Akka HTTP, but which the users can also choose from. And sometimes hard to, to start, to, to know where to start, which to use. Um, so I try to, to give some guidelines here. Um, OK. So one very often asked question is, if we go a step back from Akka and decide, if I want to do something with HTTP, with Scala, should I use Play, or should I use Akka HTTP, or should I use something else? Um, so there again, the question is, what, what is Akka HTTP? What, what tries it to be? So, and, and we say in the Akka HTTP documentation is that Akka HTTP implement an HTTP stack. So we implement everything for needed to do uh, things with HTTP, but it is not a web framework. So, but again, it's a, it's a toolkit. And while you can use it with a browser, it's not the main focus. So it's more for writing web servers which are consumed by other, other computers. So the gen general guideline for this question would be, okay, if you're writing a web application, and you want all the tools um, the, the web designers can work with and actually do web pages, 
play is probably the right thing to use because it has all the tools to so the, the, the common stack to, to actually build web applications. Um, it, it gives you lo lots of structures, lo lots of structure. So what a framework usually does. So an ACA HTTP is more useful if you already have some kind of service in mind and want to offer some HTTP API for your service. So an ACA HTTP doesn't try to force you into a specific model, but it tries to sit, sit at the side and help you actually offering your service to the world. Um, maybe another thing which I should mention here is, um, is Ligom, which is, a, which is another open source project from, um, from Lightband, which again is a, fra which again is a framework which, which helps you to, to build web services and web applications, but in a, together with the whole architecture of um, how, to, how to put this in a, in a cluster and how to do things with, with the rest of the ACA tools correctly. So, but this is on a, on a higher level, this is on an architectural level, while ACA HTTP is um, more a library you can, can use if you need its features. So, okay. So if we, if you look at ACA, I mean, it's, it can be really um, overwhelming if you, if you look at the documentation and see all those modules in there. So let's start with a quick overview um, of what, which are the most important modules in ACA. So basically the core modules are ACA Actor, with the, the original module with, which contains all you need to work with actors <coughs> to, to write um, distributed applications um, and deal with concurrency in a safe way. Then on top of that we have ACA Cluster and, um, and Friends, I say, if you, if you was at the t last talk at, at risk then there were I think all, all of those, this box of tools in this corner of ACA was, was explained very well. So this is about distributing actors on, a, on, on different nodes and coordinating work between nodes on, in a cluster. Then a relatively new thing is ACA Stream, which is about um, doing stream processing, not with actors, but with a new kind of abstraction. Um, so there, there were other talks um, also about ACA streams and the re relationship to, to ACA HTTP. I have put some links in the end, so I really recommend to, to have another look at, at these kinds of um, presentations, which are more about why, why are streams, so well, streaming architecture, why is it important nowadays and how it relates to ACA HTTP. So you might want to, want to watch one of these talks. So, and then um, we have ACA HTTP, which is based on ACA streams. So it's, n it's not based on actors anymore like Spray, but instead it's now based on ACA streams. And then there's a very new project, which is called Alpaca. I don't know if you have heard about it, who has heard about it? So Alpaca, <laughs> so ACA stream was basically invented or developed to to fill this need to, to do stream processing in a, in a nice way. And um, ACA Stream is obviously not the only, the only, or ACA is not the only project who has found that stream processing is important. So there, there are lots of stream streaming frameworks, libraries on the JVM right now, like, like Kafka or um, what else is there? Yeah, lots of stuff. So, and so we see ACA Stream as an API to actually do stream processing in a very general way, but to actually use it in applications, you, need, you often need to interface with other systems which are, might use some other kind of technique. So what we try to do with Alpaca is gathering all those connectors to third-party software which is related to streaming in some way in a single place. Um, so another thing to say here is, um, in the in the past, all of the ACA modules were 
in one single repository and um, they all had only a single release cycle. Um, this has now changed a bit. So the latest version of the um, of the above um, modules is 2.4.12 and we now split out the alpaca project because um, yeah it wouldn't be it wouldn't be uh, good if we would um, pull in all those dependencies to all those third party libraries into the aka main repository and also if we would lock the release cycle of aka core with with these extension projects and since since one or two months also we split out also aka http because it can it can live independently from aka and also something we want to really encourage people to is to contribute and this is really hard with with the aka core because um, we want to give very very hard uh, compatibility um, guarantees so uh, if you can see we are at 2.4.12 so we do many releases which need to be binary compatible and we think that aka http can still need some room to to improve and to evolve in a in a less strictly limited way so we split out aka http so what's an aka http an aka http itself has several modules so the most important one is just aka http and we have a lower layer below this which actually contains the the implementation which is aka http core then there's there's a test kit yeah it's similar to to what aka provides to help writing tests and then there are several again connector modules which help yeah integrating with with other tools so if we look at at how these things stack together. Um, so this is the stack basically. So on top you, you have your, your application or maybe better your service. And if you want to, to bring it to, to the web, you can use Aka HTTP, which sits on top of the, of the implementation Aka HTTP core. And this sits on Aka IO, which is part of um, Aka Actor, which is just an, uh, yeah, which is a network a networking module for, for Akka. And all of these parts are tied together with Akka Stream. So Akka Stream is really a, a component which helps um, to connect uh, layers of, of software together. So yeah, I already said that Akka HTTP now is in its own repository. This has some, some advantages, some disadvantages. So one of the, of the main driving things for this was really to, to help people and to encourage and um, people to, to contribute to Akka. Um, there was, was a post on, on Akka Meta, which is like, like our internal open, uh, internal but still open um, board for discussing things around Akka, which said you, the extended Akka team. So, so we extended the, the ACA team for ACA HTTP and give more people commit rights and, uh, and yeah, just to, to acknowledge that they, they were helpful in the past and that they can, can help us develop ACA HTTP. So it now has it, its own release cycle. We, for a long time, ACA HTTP was experimental. It is not anymore. And so we are just in the process of actually releasing the, the first version. Yes. Uh, Aka HTTP version coupled to uh, Aka? Does it depend on a particular language or? Yes. Um, so so right now, we you can use any of of um, Aka 2.4. Mm -hmm. So because this is currently really the only one which is really really current right now, and what we will do when a new Aka version comes out is not it's not clear right now, but Hopefully, most of Aka stays compatible enough that we can still support um, many versions um, with the same artifact. If this wouldn't be possible, we would need to yeah, think about something like cross-building to against several Aka versions, but that's not yet the case. 
So, and, and one thing, so the release cycle is decoupled and now we, we also needed to think about uh, what new version number would we take for, um, for Aka HTTP. So the last Aka HTTP module in the, in the old repository was 2.4.11. And so now to actually to, to actually say that Aka HTTP is something something else, and so that you aren't confused with with the with the Aka version numbers, we yeah just took some version number out of thin air, and this is the 10.0. <laughs> so the new version number will be 10.0, and we actually re release 10.0. Oh, uh, release candidate two today, so it's not really announced, but yeah. So this is actually uh, it's really called release candidate two, but it's really the first one, which which is called ten dot dot and some some rational about the the reasons why we changed the number. You can yeah click on the link and <laughs> read it up. So in the future, the only thing you need is to pull this in your SPT uh, build file and then you can use like HTTP and you can mix it with the latest of like Ecto. So, enough of the boring administrative stuff. Let's see how you can, can use like HTTP actually. So, I prepared a small demo just to let you, if you haven't used it, to see how you can use it. Okay. So usually, if you just want to use Aka HTTP, oh, let's see. Is this big enough? <laughs> so the only the only dependency declaration you need is this one. So the other ones we will need later in later examples. So but right now you only need this one. Okay, so the simple Aka HTTP program you, you could write is basically this. So we have a few imports at the top. So we still depend on on an Aka Actor system, which yeah is basically the the, the runtime for for everything related to Aka. Then we have an entry point, which is for all things, for all Aka HTTP things, which is here in this package, and you can also already see, so we have something which is called Scala DSL, and this points to the fact that we also have something else, with, which is Java DSL. So the, our current policy with, with Akka is to provide all APIs in, in actually exactly the same um, amount of features, also for Java. So if, you, if you're coming from Java, you can use Java DSL at this point, and, and the APIs will look very similar. Okay, another thing we need is the, the actor materializer, which is a thing from stream, which is basically the runtime for, for Akka stream, on which Akka HTTP is built. So let's see how a simple app would, would look like. So this is basically the, the simplest thing you can have. So in the, in the beginning, we instantiate the runtime. Um, here we import an execution context to do something with, with futures. If you, knew, if you know Scala futures, you, knew, you, you know that you need an implicit um, execution context and scope, so we will get that here. Then um, we create a, a stream uh, runtime, basically, and then we can write our first Aka HTTP server. And an Aka HTTP server is written by saying HTTP, so this loads um, yeah, basically the HTTP module from from Akka, and say bind and handle async. What means bind? Bind to the network uh, network address we give here, so localhost port 8080. And we want to specify a handler if we use bind and handle async. So this a handler is just a function from HTTP request to HTTP response to future of HTTP response, which means that we can do asynchronous processing in here, so we don't need to return a re response immediately. So this is basically the, the most simple one. We just, ignore, we just ignore the request here and synchronously return 
an HTTP response with a certain kind of entity. So if you don't know about HTTP or Spray before, so we really try to model the, the whole HTTP universe very, uh, very, um, in, in very deep detail. So if we go into HTTP request, which is a model class from HTTP, you can see that HTTP request really models the things which are in an HTTP request. So we have the, the, the method, we have the, the target URI, we have a set of headers, we have the, the entity or the body of a request, and in the end we have the protocol. So, and it's the same for, for the HTTP response. So an HTTP response comprised of a status code, of headers, the response entity, and the protocol again. So, and here we already use some Scala feature um, of, of default ag arguments, so we don't have to, to actually specify all those parameters, but we can just rely on the defaults and for, for HTTP response, it's and usually for the entity it could be empty, but we say, okay, let's be hello world. The status could should be 200, okay. So, and you see that it's underlined here, which means that um, there's an implicit conversion going on, which actually converts this, this string into to a binary representation of the entity. So it's just us here, but yeah. I will talk a bit later about how entities work in HTTP. So let's try this. This shouldn't be hard. What's happening? Uh, hmm. Oh no, is there, is there a shortcut to exit the... <laughs> yeah, this would be nice, but it doesn't work. Ah, I don't know what's in Okay. Back. Okay, so I loaded the project in SPT, and let's say run main, uh, example three. Okay, so <coughs> so what I didn't tell you, so bind and handle async returns a future which you can inspect to see if the uh, actual binding of the server was successful or not. So if it was successful, it says this message and then waits for, for just a, uh, for a new line before it just terminates the server again and otherwise it just prints the error. Okay, so let's run a let's run a request against the server. I'm using a tool which is called httpy, which is quite nice to wah. Yeah my prompt is too long. So this tool gives us a nice return. Yay! So this is the most simple thing you can do in HTTP. What was the name of this tool again? HTTP. Let's see. So it's written like this. And um, yeah, so, so it's quite nice because you don't have to specify HTTP. Uh, colon, double slash, and stuff like that, and you can, you can add headers, and it will um, syntax highlight JSON and stuff like that. We will see later. Okay, so this was the first example. No, one direction. Sorry. Yeah, good point. This is something which I found out today as well, so I just... <laughs> I mean, I can't, I can't yeah, I, I filed, an, filed an issue for that today. <laughs> so uh, I think in, in, in the old Akai HTTP build, there was some script which actually replaced the number somewhere. It's, it's, it's a constant somewhere. And it hasn't changed, <laughs> been changed, so. Okay, yeah, I see you <laughs> paying attention. Okay, so to, to summarize, you need, you need a bit of boilerplate, and then you use HTTP bind and handle async 
to bind a ha handler function to, to serve a server on a certain TCP port. So what you, you could do is now inspect, inspect our, our module, our request, by just calling methods on it and, and see what's in the request, and um, then construct a response again with these classes I showed. But this is actually not the best way to do it. That's why I striked it through here. But I will show, show in a moment how, how you can do it better. So if you lo look a bit deeper into this, um, into this um, bind and handle async function and these, this entry point to, to ArcHTTP, you will see that there, there are more entry points than this one. So this one is, is the main one, I think. But there are also other ones, so you can also provide an asynchronous handler if you don't need to, to handle things asynchronously. Or what you can also do, you can fall back to the, to the ARCA Streams um, API and provide instead a flow of ARCA HTTP request to ARCA HTTP response, which means you provide some component, if you don't know ARCA Stream, which has as input HTTP request and then output, outputs HTTP responses um, on the output side. So in the, in, if this is not low level enough for you, you can even go one level deeper um, and get something which, where you don't um, return any, um, where you don't pass in any handler anymore, but you get back a, a source of all the connections you get in. And for all the connections you get, the flow of this connection, which is something which is reversed from before. So the, the handler is exactly the inverse of this flow. So in the end, you can just put them together. So you can call handle with, with that and then join the flow from the, from the connection with your handler. So this is another way to, to actually use like HTTP. But I just showed to you because to, to explain that there are multiple choices. So if you yeah, it depends on which layer you, you need to, to interact with HTTP. And we try to give you all access to all, all those entry points on, on every layer so you can, can customize it if you need it, which you won't probably do in, in most cases, but yeah, if you want to, you can. So there's even one level below this um, is... Ah. Um, is the server layer, so you can actually construct the server layer, which is the HTTP implementation, but don't put it on top of TCP. So you could choose another transport if that's interesting to you. I mean, it probably won't be to most of you, but you can do it if you want to. Okay. So let's go back. And again, you have lots of choices. So you need to yeah, collect experience with ArcHTTP to actually know which, on which level to, to do things. But what I would recommend if you start with it, just start with the highest layer, the highest layer of abstraction that's usually fine. And when you find that you need something, something else, you can, can go a level deeper, which is nice. So yeah, I showed you these ones. So to summary, just use this one in the start and use them together with the higher level API, which I will show next, unless you need to, to ne really need this streaming interface of flow request to response. <coughs> now the next question is how, how to improve this um, writing of, uh, um, of servers. So if we look how, if, if we just would continue to, to write handlers like this, so which just tries to inspect an HTTP request and uh, returns an HTTP response, quickly gets quite, quite verbose. So for example, you, you could do it with pattern matching. Then we'd write, OK, we get a request. Let's look into it. Yes, it's a get request. And which, when it has <coughs> a certain part, Yes, then return this um, HTTP response. So this works perfectly fine. 
So let's try this example. On again. Okay, what does it say? It says internal server error. <coughs> Do you see why? Yeah, exactly. So, so I didn't specify any path, so it requested the the slash, and our our code just crashed here with a match error because we didn't we didn't match for this path. So, if we use the right path here, it actually works, which is nice. <laughs> but so, this is. This is not really, a, this again is not really the, uh, the, the right error message here, right? So the server shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't crash and return in uh, 500 if, if a path is not found. So the idea which was, I think, which was invented for, for spray routing was to, to get something more flexible than this and help you with all the stuff which, which is common in, in writing. Um, HTTP web services and HTTP servers in general. So now let's use routes instead. Um, so a route in um, Akai HTTP is comprised of directives and routes. So you compose your, your handling logic from, from primitives. And in um, Akai HTTP, these primitives can be imported from directives. Let's import this. From Scala DSL server directives. So now we have a lot of tools on our scope. So, and yet now to write the equivalent code for this. So, okay, let's filter on the requests, only take get requests. Then filter on the path. We're only interested about the, in the path ABC. Okay, and if we match this request, um, return a result, which is called complete in like HTTP. And then say hello world. So and again, you can see it's underlined, which means there's some implicit conversion going on here to actually make that work. Yeah, that's, that's another thing. So if you use the path directive, it will automatically um, match uh, prefix slash, so slash at the beginning. So this is just convenience because as you will later see, you will be able to nest these things and then the slashes would be distracting basically, so we don't require you to put them here. Okay, so now the route is actually of type route. I can add this here. And a route is not quite the same thing as, um, as the handler function before. I, I will show later what a route is exactly. So we need to, to convert it and we can just say, okay, route async handler, route. So now we have some structure which represents the same function as before. And we can just put it like before into this function and now have a server which uses routes instead of this pattern matching. So let's remove that. So let's restart. Okay. Okay. So basically the same answer here. So nothing you learned. But let's see what happens if we use the wrong kind of path. So what we now get is we get the right error messages for free. So. If we don't match for a path and we don't handle it, we will get a 404. So if we use another HTTP method, for example, put, and we don't 
implement something to handle put requests, we will get the right, the right status code as, as well. So we get a 405 method not allowed with a header which actually says, says which, which methods are allowed and also, uh, also a descriptive message which helps, helps the user or the developer to, to know what, what's, what's the error at this point. So, let's see. So hopefully that's what you've seen. <laughs> Okay, now lots, there are lots of more things in, in routing. So um, we have a whole library of things which we have pre-built for you, like filters and stuff. So let's open the, uh, the web page. So in the documentation, you've got all kinds of stuff. Uh, why is that? So we have things about authentication, um, cookie handling, we have things for decoding and encoding, um, for, for compressed um, requests or responses. Um, yeah, I mean, you, if you start with, with ArchHTV, it makes sense just to go through this list and just see what, what, what things are in there. There are things to handle file uploads, there are things to handle form fields. Um, we have things to directly um, serve um, files and resources directly either from the class path or from files. You can also have browsable directory listings. So. Yeah, you can extract headers. So this list is interesting too. Just get started. Let's see, for example, let's say we want to, we want to access a par parameter in the um, of the um, of the request so uh, a query parameter so if you if you would use pattern matching so all of this would be here in the uri and you would have to try to figure out how to how to get a certain parameter out of this so this is now much easier let's put another path here so if you want to <coughs> um, put other things here you need this quickly thing, which means, okay, I have an alternative to this path. This may be another path. Oh, let's call it another. So, and at that path, we want to, we want to um, get some parameters. So we say, okay, let's get a name. The name parameter. And when you use directive, which extract something from the from the request you can directly um, you get it so the directive will will extract the the name query parameter from the from the query and supply it to your to your logic here so you can directly use it further say okay hello well, hello name Yes. So if I use 10 directives, do I have to nest them in 10, 10 levels deep? Yes. You can, yeah, you, you don't have to, but you can, yeah. Yes. You can. Sorry? If we use 10 parameters, for example, like name, last name. Ah, ah, you mean you mean parameters? Or no, directives. directives. Okay, but both, both questions are interesting. Uh -huh. So, okay, let's start with name and see how it works. <laughs> Okay, again, um, uh, not this one, this one. So, how was it called? Another. Let's call it like this. Okay, so we get again 404 not found, but because the request is requesting the my query parameter, so it again, uh, ArchHDB tries to help you with, with figuring out what's got, what went wrong. And since it's part of the URI, the HTTP spec says, okay, you should return a 404, so that's why it's a 404. Um, I think I can just put it here. So, yay, <laughs> works again. So again, okay, now let's 
let's introduce another parameter. And we can just do that here as well. We can, when we actually have an alias, we can use parameters, but it doesn't matter if you use parameter or parameters. Um, let's say h. And then we can just put it here as well. Okay. Let's run that again. Ah. Uh, and H. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I just, I just wondered why does it say uh, it um, yeah. Which one? Yeah, yeah. You, you can do it better, right? But I just wanted to to put it here, like in the in the thing, uh, in the in the URL. I think you can just say double equal sign. Double I here. Ah, oh, interesting. Okay. Ah, cool. Thanks. Cool. So, but this is not the only thing you can do. So, if you if you get um, your i parameters like that, they will be they will be strings. But often you you don't want to. You know that these aren't strings. So you can say, okay, I know it's something else. I want to have this as an integer. And in the moment you write this, this parameter here will get will be an integer. So, age in ten years. <coughs> Sorry. Can it be option? Yeah, it can be option as well. <laughs> so if I wouldn't use this one, you know, Arca is, um, Scala is a type safe language. It should complain now if it's if it's just a string. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Something is broken. Oh no! Oh no! Yeah, because plus is you. Ah, but that's interesting as well. So so let's just try that. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> ah yeah 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 thanks. <laughs> so once again, uh, yeah. So now it doesn't calculate correctly. So if we say as end, now it will be an end actually, and now. Yeah, so it calculates correctly. And the another, the another thing is, so if you put there something strange things here, it again will give you the right, the right error message. So, and it says what you actually wanted to have here. So this is nice, yeah? So how can you implement different logic depending on whether certain parameter is present, if parameter uh, name is present, age is optional, or if last name is there, name should be there? Yeah, I think you, you have several options. So either you can just say dot x um, dot question mark. So now this age parameter is an option of int, suddenly. So So you can use you can now use any kind of um, option processing like uh, map plus ten get to else <laughs> this so let's see what happens so if we use that that's not possible so if it's optional you still need to <laughs> provide the right type so if we again say 24 everything is fine and if we just leave it out 
it will use the other case. But if you have more complex things, like you said, like like more complex grammars of, of parameters, what you also can do is um, you can again uh, let's keep it here. Um, so this this quickly parameter, the the rot alternative operator, is, is more powerful than just um, choosing between alternatives of of paths. So, what happens if if some if, if this doesn't if, if a request doesn't flow through the through the route tree and all those filters successfully? Is that this, for example, if, if no name parameter is existent, then the parameters directive will reject the um, request and will give it back to the to the outer scope, and if, if you then add another alternative here, or here, for example, you could just have another um, alternative here to, let's say, okay, we only need H here. Oh, just So if we now just have an H, it will actually fall through this, through the first branch here, and will then go into the second one, so until something is found. And so the flow from, uh, for, for a request is it it starts actually at the beginning, and it just flows from the top to the bottom. So by this is another kind of freedom you have if you use HTTP routes that you can just by Changing the, the, the order of, of, of your route components, so you can, can change the behavior. You are, uh, defining alternative routes. Exactly. So, exactly, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Can actually, yes. Uh, can you do something about that the uh, alternatives are always one more up indented? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, it would be nice. So what we often do is just we, we just say um, so it's now indented because I have uh, in this project I enabled the the formatter the automatically scalar form so it will just use the normal thing. So what we often do is just we say format I think uh, format off something like that. So to to <laughs> just switch off the <laughs> syntax formatting. But yeah, it would be nice if scalar form actually would support some some customization and. I think. Good news is it will just about the first one. So yeah, it would be nice if they, if those would be on the same line. I agree. Um, so and back to the to, to the to your question, Daniel, about um, whether you need this deep levels of indentation. And what you can do as well is just um, you can actually combine directors in another way. So. Um, well, let's do it. Oh, let's just add another one here. So let's say we want to have a put request at a certain path, path and we can also just say put and well, path put. And just combine directives in this way as well. So now that's exactly the same as as if you would have um, nested it. So you have lots of lots of freedom how to structure your routes. Um, and I think no one of this is better or worse than the other one. Um, also, what you can also do is, yeah. Uh, what's about extracting parameters from the path? Like tailing IDs in an API. Yes, that's possible as well. <laughs> um, where to put that? Okay. Like a segment of the path or something? No, let's say uh, an ID at the end. An ID? Okay. Yeah. Say user. You can say okay. 
let's put a slash here and say um, int number. So because uh, you cannot, yeah, it's, uh, the syntax is a bit different than, than for parameters because, I mean, you need some kind of placeholder. Example. So then again, <coughs> we run this. So what's the user thirty-five? So, so it tries to be very consistent and the features it offers in all for all directives. So, and again, here you could also have multiple segments and extract them or say, okay, the next one needs to be a double number and then you need to add it here as well. So, and again, if we, if we put something unmatching here, okay, now we, we cannot really um, give you a better error message because what happens is that the, the path directive just falls through to the next if, if it doesn't match. Okay, so there are lots of features like that. So, I mean, we've now seen, okay, you can filter on methods, you can filter on, on path and extract things from paths. Um, we have some general thing which is called complete to, to generate responses. We can um, provide alternatives, alternative routes. Um, Yes. <coughs> uh, just yeah, Scala or uh, internally is you probably can also extract uh, in the path another stuff into some method or yeah, class some another resource or stuff to build uh, bigger APIs from small. Yeah, exactly. So, so the good thing is you can just um, so all of these things here are just are basically just functions. A route is a function. And as functions are values in Scala, you can just take this and put it into a, in, into a variable. Say, OK, this is the user route. And put it again here. So this is one thing you can do. You can do other things, other kinds of abstractions. I wanted to show them, them later, so maybe go back to that like, later. Okay, you've seen get and path parameter. So an alternative to complete is you can use redirect to, to generate an, um, yeah, a 302 or 301 response. Um, then there are other directives which change the, which actually change the, um, the response. So directives don't only um, Act on the on the request, but they can also change the res response. So, for example, if we want to, let's say, let's add an, a header here. Um, what kind of header? Which one? Yeah. Okay. That that would be a custom one. Okay. If you want to have custom headers, you you need to call them raw header. So these are just the usual string to string things. Oh, this didn't work for some reason. Oh, it did. So um, if we try this again, let's say this H1, this one. So it will now have this header. But um, okay, HTTP has, a, has actually a whole library of modeled headers. So, um, so if you don't use custom ones, but some which are specified in some way, like let's say, um, do I have this in scope? Yes. 
So we have all these kind of headers already predefined. So um, let's say last modified. So they are actually ty ty type safe. So you need, need to put there uh, an actual date time in, in there. I think we can date time now. So you will get it in a time safe way. So yes, that's for headers. What about routing based on user role? If you have some kind of authentication. Um, yes. So um, we offer already um, an. Uh, basic authentication um, directive so which you can use for example to to find a user for the request uh, so or to get the to get the user which was authenticated um, and again you get this user here as a as an extracted value and afterwards you can can do with it what you want so um, what kind of routing do you have in mind like Yes. Um, so again, so so you get so you would use the first the the basic authentication or authenticate basic. So you say real whatever, and then you specify some kind of authenticator, which is a function which says, okay, is, is this person with this um, with this the user with this password? Is it is is she? Um, Authenticated, and then you get the, the you get the user. I just cheat here because I don't want to put in, so it, it won't work. But and then you will get some kind of user. So the authenticator can specify which kind of user you get. And then you would probably use something like the authorized directive, which would just be a check, um, any kind of check. So you can say, okay, if user has has role then go into this block and otherwise do something something else but so there's no pre-built um, user management thing but you could build it yourself probably okay okay so let's see where we were here well mirror displays Okay, we are at point, at point five. I have 13 numbers here, so I don't think we will <laughs> get to all of them, but that's perfectly fine, so because I didn't know uh, what to expect. So another thing with, um, um, with handling paths, I, I put it here as an extra point, but it's really a small thing, actually. So usually you have some, some kind of nested path structure. Um, and uh, maybe let's just open the other. Example. So, for example, you could just have some different endpoints in uh, below user. So you could write it like this, but you don't have to. So, what you can do is nest those path, path directives, and if you say path prefix instead of path. Um, it will also match if um, if there's a suffix to the path which you want to match later. So we can now also do it like this. And then uh, Whatever. So, so the route structure is pretty flexible, so you can can nest it like you want to. And so now path prefix will will match the user away from the URI, and then you just match the rest of it. And if you use path, you actually match the complete path. So if there's something below that, it won't match. So, so these are these path directives and. If you want to to surf something at slash user and nothing else, there's also just path end. So 
you can um, provide um, some endpoints at just in the nested form also with so this is basically the same as to say path user on the on the higher level but depending on how you want to structure your API it might, might make sense to split it up like that um, so at some point if I go back to the slides Sorry. yeah Yes, you could. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You could. So, let's try this out. Woohoo! So, this is one of the nice messages you get from the compiler. So, the DSL looks really nice, but something sometimes if something happens. <laughs> You get really bad error messages because it actually uses some quite advanced features of Scala. Oh, the other example is broken. Yeah. What did I do? Yeah. Okay. I don't know what, what's wrong with it, but let's just get rid of it. Okay, so we had we now have uh, like user ghi. So we just say user. So we have this, but it's still it's not quite correct because we could just put anything in here, and it would still be used. So if you want to provide some some kind of default behavior, yeah, that's perfectly fine. But if you want to make sure it's only it, it only matches when when actually the path really ends here. You need to use path end. So, wow. So now again, if I again started with some some arbitrary suffix, it will give us a 404. So, and it will work for this one. So there are also some heated debates if if this URL or the one with the slash at the end is actually the same. So <laughs> the spec says, okay, it's, they are different URIs, but I mean, I think you have to decide for your own service if, and your for, your for, for your own scheme if, if that's fine or not. And actually we um, support both. So you can say, yeah, okay, we want only to match the path end, or we want to match the path with a single slash at the end, or we want to match both of them. So this is, so you can choose one of them because people have asked to do that. So. I, yeah, this this is actually from Google, so it's on the Google blog, and they explain if you should do it or not. So, yeah, I think it's a matter of taste how to do it. We we don't say you must do it like this or like this. I mean, it's probably useful to to use just one of them, so people don't get confused and then um, redirect to the to the alternative you cho chose. So you can build a directive actually, which actually does this. So when we We've done that in some project, which I've linked you. Okay. So, in general, if you so this is kind of a general template. If you how to structure your your paths. So, if you want to to at the root level to to match the the empty URI basically, so the empty path, you still have to match path single slash. So you can't match path end at the at the top level. And the reason is that for HTTP there is no URI with no empty URI, because in the request you need to write get slash HTTP, so there is no empty. So the root level is something to keep in mind. So the root level you have to to match the single slash always. So then you can match like static paths. You can can nest routes arbitrarily deeply with path prefix. So all the leaves usually. You use path at the leaves to make sure that there's no arbitrary suffix at the end. You can extract things. You can also extract so a segment as just a string segment, or you can just use int number, double number, there some some predefined things. You can also define your own things. So 
Actually, this is a, a small DSL inside inside the path. So to put this these things here together. So this is actually actually an old small DSL to to write things like this, which is called path matcher. And you can you can extend it with your own kind of, of formats if you have something you want to support. But we we have some some things you you often use already defined like int number, long number, yeah, hex numbers. For some reason, I think it's somewhere is your UIDs. People were asking for that for some reason. <laughs> um, you can also match several several segments in one as a list. So you don't, if you want to be, have some generic um, functionality afterwards to, to actually uh, yeah, match it, you, you can also restrict the number of uh, segments you want to match. So let's see, yeah, I think that's basically it, all kinds of numbers. Ah, or you can, that's maybe interesting, you can just match the whole remaining path. If you if you are just interested in, in matching and filtering on the prefix and then doing something else with the rest of the park uh, with the rest of the path in an opaque way. Okay. So this I think is path matching. So what's the time? Oh, okay. Already late. I mean Depends on what you're interested in. Um, should I just continue or should we? Do you have examples for streaming stuff? I think that's one of the special edge with the special cases you wrote HTTP for. Yes, a few, but not in the. Uh, so you will have to go to the to the other um, uh, talks I've I've linked in the end to to have the the full talk about streams and uh, HTTP. But I can show a bit about that. Um, so. Maybe a quick word about how to deal with errors. So, uh, as I said before, all these directives, if they, if they, if the filter fails basically and they can't, can't go in there, they they don't return the error response directly, but they return a rejection, and the rejection is just an abstraction of errors that can happen. And so, what happens? So, if, for example, this path doesn't match, this directive returns a rejection, and then the alternatives can actually run. And if all of these reject with some kind of rejection, the re rejection gets passed back to the outer layers. So the outer layers can then decide what to do with the error. And when you fall out of the top level route, there's a default handling, which then handles rejections which haven't been handled so far. And this rejection handling actually then produces those uh, 404 errors and stuff like that. So, and go let's look rejection handler. So we have a little DSL again to to define what if you want to define your own rejection handler to say what what you want to do with errors. And the good thing is, so you don't have to act immediately when you have an error, but you can throw any not throwing, but you can just return a rejection or reject the, re, um, the, reject the request and then put all of the, the error handling at a central point where you want to do it. So, and if you don't specify anything, you will, it will go to the default rejection handler with, which is given here. For example, if the get, if, if the get um, directive gets a pull request, it will reject with a method rejection. And um, so if you have multiple um, a method uh, directives, all of those re rejections will be collected at the end and then this rejection handler will will have a look at these rejections and then actually produce this uh, method you we've seen before, the, the four or five method not allowed. So we've also modeled all of the status codes. So we have the big list of status codes with um, the numbers and the text and also here the description so you can you can use those constants but you can also use I mean you could also say it's just four or five in this place here. so this is um, 
One part of um, rejection handling is the same, especially for, for exceptions. So if any of your code throws an exception at this point, this exception will also propagate to the outer layers. And either you can say at some point, okay, handle exception and provide an exception handler here, which actually um, turns this exception into some kind of response because, I mean, this might be an ex expected exception and you might be able to handle it. Or again, if you don't, if you don't handle exceptions, it will fall out of here and um, will get to the default exception handler, which will just um, uh, produce a 500 response. So, which is, I think, good practice for for web services. Does the user or the client then get to see the stack trace? Not, not by default, no. Right. Because I mean, this is usually seem. Uh, as a as a security yeah, problem, so horrible. yeah. So I mean, yeah, we've all seen those stack trace pages from from like Tomcat, and yeah. <laughs> which contains all kind of details. So. Okay, let's. Yeah, I think I just skip this. <laughs> um, so I talked a bit of how to structure routes in general. So all of those route blocks are basically. Um, Values, so you can extract them into into values and just reuse them or put them in put them in defs and um, make your own uh, little versions of them which do something special. Um, so maybe I show a little bit here. So because I've prepared it, I think this should be simple. Uh, oh no, I think we can skip this. So there's basically no, so we don't require you, we don't give you any form how you, how you have to structure your routes. I mean, you can, you can nest it as deeply if you, as you want. If you, if you want, you can do 20 levels deep. I mean, I guess it will be slower to compile, but you can also just extract things and mix things together. I mean, one pattern was to, to split up your route into like business domains and put uh, put each part of the route like user handling and the user trade and another thing and another trade and then mix them together in the end into some uh, using the basically the cake pattern to mix them together in the end into your big route and then just have a single service um, declaration where you say okay use this route or this route or this route or this route with the route alternative um, operator and so you're pretty free to do what you want it depends on how you want to structure your, your program. So let's go to entities because entities is what actually contains the streaming aspect of, of HTTP, which is the biggest change over, over Spray. So let's see. So up until now, we just said, OK, let's return a string here but of course we cannot uh, response doesn't re doesn't contain just a string as a body in, in fact it just um, it has a body which is is a byte a byte string on the so it's an array of bytes on the wire with a content type which describes what the data is supposed to be so and we have modeled this in uh, in HTTP again so we have this type HTTP entity which describes the body of a of a request or response together with with its content type and maybe with a, its content length. So we can now say here, okay, we want an HTTP entity of type um, content types. So a few things are predefined. For example. Okay, let's say we want to have this as text plane. Um, and then here we, uh, I mean, we have a few overloads. We could just say, okay, it should be a string, but so what it actually wants to have is a byte string, so a sequence of bytes. So we just could, could just put in a, well, a byte string here. So, and why is it red? 
is it actually red? <coughs> so let's see example. So it actually compiles. So this is another problem. So the the DSL uses some features which are heavily typed. So sometimes the IDEs um, get confused and especially this example is especially bad because it's in our, on, on our introductory page in the, in the documentation as I found out last week. Uh, so this can be really confusing. So we, we, need, to <laughs> we need to improve it somehow. Okay, but this is, so this is just the uh, <laughs> yeah, we could try to fix it. So these are basically equivalence forms of that. So, but this is still not the the final form here. So, what ex actually happens if you just say ABC or you create an an entity with um, <coughs> where with a static with a single static string as a special subtype of HTTP entity, which is called HTTP entity strict. So, and this is basically the only thing we had, we had in spray. So, this is a thing which takes one um, byte string from memory. So, we don't supply a stream here. So, but now with the new streaming features, we can also use other subtypes of HTTP entity to, to actually supply streams directly as the, as the, as the body of a, of a response. Um, so, yeah, it's, let's say default instead. And if we use the default entity, we can supply a stream here. Let's get rid of the red underline by actually returning a complete response. So, and for, for re default response, we need to supply the num, the content length as well. And now we need to supply an actual stream. So, you can now say here, okay, we want to have a stream I mean, this is this is stupid to to just create a, a stream from from static elements, but we can just do it like this to to showcase how it works in general. Okay, so we now return an entity of type text plane with length four which is supplied as a stream. So we have two, actually two sources here, two streams, one uh, with the start of the, of the string and the rest with the end. So, but now, but yeah, the size is not correct, right? Let's try it later, what happens? <laughs> mm. So, but, yeah, actually this is not nothing we can actually fix, really, because, I mean, if you supply a stream, the stream streams could be inf infinite. So we cannot we cannot know the um, or we cannot check the size before we have um, actually served all the data. So at the beginning, we need to we we need to just. Um, For chunks, you need to go to the floor, right? Yeah, if you want to do chunked. Yeah. yeah. Again, we can again use use sources. So. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, if you haven't used Akka Stream, it might be a bit hard to understand. But so, a source is basically the the abstraction and from Akka Stream to to which represents a stream or the source of a stream. And so, we just need to to um, supply a data source here. <coughs> In this case, we we concatenate two sources both of a single, um, single static um, byte string. So let's see, I think I compiled it. Um, where are we under user still? So this works, but I mean, it's not much interesting to see here. 
Um, the only thing which might be interesting is so it doesn't matter if you use this default entity type. So default, it's called default because it's the one which you will get usually if a client sent a request or if, if you uh, produce a response. So it's a streaming response with a content length and a content type. This means default. Um, but on the wire, it's actually the same as if you would have used strict and just supplied the, uh, the byte string in, in one piece. So this is just an API-wise change, and this is, this is important if you receive data in, re in requests because you cannot really, you, you don't know if you will receive a strict in entity or the default one. It depends on whether the low-level um, implementation actually gets all of the data in one go or if it gets us um, small pieces at a time. Okay, so if you don't know, so that there are times where you don't know the, the content length up front. So there are two choices in actually in HTTP and also in ACA HTTP to, um, to create a, a response like this. So one is um, to say chunked. So this will create a transfer encoding chunked um, response. So if we run this, right, that's not. Um, so we, we don't really see how it's um, transmitted on the wire. So on the wire, it would have been two chunks, and the transfer encoding chunk says, OK, um, always prefix every chunk with, with the length of the chunk. So what it would have said is 2AB2EF. But this tool actually, and also curl, I tried also with curl, they both. Um, just mm -hmm. aggregated for you directly, so we cannot really um, see it here. So actually, for for responses, there's there's another choice. You can can use close delimited. Um, so we modeled another aspect of of HTTP here, and th this is that you can for for responses you don't need to supply um, a content length, and you don't don't have to use chunked, you can use close delimited, which means you just close the connection when you're finished sending. So, but this only works for, for responses, obviously, <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it, it still works on, on HTTP 1.1, but um, in HTTP 1.1 they changed the default for persistent connections. So, in HTTP 1.1, a connection is persistent by default, which means you don't close it after one response, after one request response cycle. Um, and instead, you have to say explicitly if you want to close it. So we will see it here now. So if we now ask it, so we have no content length. But as we are speaking HTTP 1.1, we will get a connection close header, which will say, OK, we'll close the connection when we are finished with this response. So these are the choices. I mean, we don't really see now the, the real power of streams here, but if we just use those static strings, but we could, what we could use here instead is, um, for example, um, we could use any kind of source. And I mean, now you can, can get stuff using the Alpaca project. For example, you can stuff from everywhere, like from a Kafka source or from, uh, from S3 and directly stream it through um, to the to the user to the client, so I mean yes. So this is for the back pressure. So if you have a slow client, um, exactly. Reading, uh, yeah, from fast S three exactly. Files. Yeah, so it won't it won't break your stuff. And this is exactly one of the things we showed in the other presentation. So yeah, I couldn't. Um, yeah, the setup is quite complicated, so I didn't want to show it here, but. Um, Definitely, if, if you're interested in stuff like that. Um, um, so let's see. So I currently don't know the syntax to create a file source. Uh, source from file? No, I think it's, it's somewhere else. I, I forgot. Uh, oh, it's, it might be stream IO. Hmm. 
Um, so the good thing is you can use anything which, which provides a, a source byte string here. Um, sorry? Unfold the integers. Ah, unfold, yeah, for example. All the integers. <laughs> ah, yeah, well, it might be, yeah, that's, that's a good idea, actually. So we can do that quickly. Um, uh, no, that's another one. I think iterate. Yes. Ah, good idea. Okay. Um, yes, we can do it. Okay, now we need to. So these are integers. We need to put them into a byte string. And then you mean here? Let's read. Uh, oh. So this is now these these combinators are all. Um, So how does it work? I never used it. Uh, yeah, let's say one second. Maximum one throttle mode. Does it work like that? Whatever. I never used this API, but uh, you will have to. Um, you can look it up in the. Like a stream documentation. Uh, so we need to import this to use one second here. So yeah, this is. Uh, this is minus big S for each Minus big S. Minus minus three. Um, uh, what? Uh, Sorry. Uh, ah. Minus minus three. Is, uh, ah, okay, yeah, cool. Good that you know it. So here, minus minus S? Minus minus three, yeah. Stream. Yeah. Stream. Yes, it, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> now we'll get this to work in those half minute we have left. Maybe the throttle is wrong. Okay, let's don't throttle. Hmm. Something is broken. Hmm. Let's try curl, just to be sure. <coughs> yeah. So it seems it worked, but minus my stream wasn't enough. I don't know. <coughs> I guess this one would work as well. Then. No? Yeah, okay, maybe so. There are several issues, but the point is you can use any kind of stream. And if you get the stream from, from somewhere else yeah. and are just in time receiving it from the network, it will just work if you just pass it in there. Okay. Um, um, yeah, I have more stuff to show, but I mean, we can do it later if you want to. Um, so. The summary is okay, HTTP give, gives you lo lots of choices and lots of freedom. Um, in general, you should try to use the high-level features first, and then um, if that doesn't work, you can always go back layer by layer. If you, if you need extra functionality, you can also override the defaults, and um, there are fallbacks if, if clients are not really, um, um, if they are not compliant to the spec and you get, you get stuff from them, you usually can access it somehow. Um, but it's also fine if you start just um, use the use the um, lower level APIs and, and write a verbose version first, and then try to convert it to to higher level features. So we won't make you any. Um, we won't say how you want, how you need to actually have to um, structure your uh, your code. Um, a thing I didn't show here really is, yeah, you can you can write your own directives, and this is really powerful to to abstract your own kind of custom functionality in the same building blocks that we have 
also pre-built for you. So if you want to see that, I can show, show it later. So I guess that's it, OK. I wanted to add, a, I wanted to end on a pessimistic note. No, I don't know. <laughs> um, so what we found, we also, uh, we also see all those choices and, and the difficulties people have, and we try to try to have pe people have problems with, with lots of stuff. So we try to improve, but yeah, we are getting there, but it's a long way. So. So here are the links to these this talk. So this is a very nice higher level talk about how streams and ArchHTTP hang together and how well, why it's important to, to have streams and streaming features. And this is actually another talk about streams and, and HTTP, but it's more a demo-like thing where you can actually see back pressure working. So exactly this thing where you receive something from, from one server and um, uh, process it in some way and then send it out to the client and if, if the client is too slow it will back pressure the whole pipeline over several nodes. So this is this is on YouTube so it's an interesting one. So thank you for listening so long. 